And uh, I worked with our Reddit. I don't think we need to. We have your uptime quoting at the end. But I like to read it then again. The end. The association will encourage the following work and projects to organize and support international conferences in biotech in Asia. Second, to assist the development and uh, linkage of regional organizations for biotech. Third, to encourage other academic and educational work or projects to accomplish the goals consistent with the objectives of the, uh, of the association. Uh, membership fees are payable from October of the previous year to the completion of the following calendar year. The example is at the time of renewal of uh, uh, EBIOS and the official journal of uh, ABA. A three tier system exists for annual membership fees. One is the registered uh, regular uh, price, that is US dollar 50 or Euro 50 or yen 5000. Um, 5, this includes the, the you buy a journal subscription and the fee associated membership of you buy a institute. And uh, second one is the reduced uh, contribution. Um, reduced contribution that is amount is up to the member and is also registered for students. So students are given a special category and uh, according to their ability they can pay the membership fees. So it is flexible in that case. This includes the um, e bias uh, journal and journal subscription. Third, no fee because of the because the person is not in a position to pay the fee. This is also a flexible one. If somebody declared that uh, he is not able to pay, then in that case, on a case by case basis, he is waived off. This does not include a hard copy of the EBIAS journal, but anyone can apply to EBIAS Institute separately for a hard copy of the journal to be considered uh, I have said case by case. And uh, in our 2006 elections results were announced. There was an election between two candidates nominated for positions of vice presidents in ABA from China. Uh, registered uh, current members of ABA could place one vote for either of the candidates. There were 16 votes for Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Lee uh, Ruping and 19 votes for Dr. Wang. Um, therefore, Dr. Wang was uh, elected. Generally, we don't uh, encourage election. And uh, if there are two candidates, uh, we would like to election. But uh, uh, in the election of a president was um, announced from two years back. Then I said I would like to withdraw and uh, one person could be nominated and elected without any uh, election. But in this case, there are two elections. Uh, elections were there, so we need to conduct uh, these uh, elections. So generally, we discourage a lobby for candidates. So unanimously, a person is elected. And so the unity of the body is maintained. And uh, this gives you the um, framework of uh, the members of board of directors this is from November 2006 to November 2008 and uh, I've been the president for this uh, current session and vice president for China is uh, Wang. Could they stand up please? Yeah, could you introduce yourself? We have regional, as far as possible we distribute the membership so that the entire Asian and other areas are represented. So, uh, I'm Yang Wang Wang from China. Uh, I work at the Center for Applied Ethics, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, I'm the first PhD uh, uh, for bioethics in China. I would like to contribute tomorrow uh, to China's bioethics development. Thank you. Big Gupta has gone out of college in the university there. Then we have a vice president from Japan, uh, Asai. It's not here. And, uh, and also we have a West Asia, Amir Jaffrey from Pakistan. Yeah, please. Uh, Persia. 
Rafi from uh, the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture. It is working. I am Amir Jafri from the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture, uh, SIUD Pakistan. And um, rest, I think I have introduced myself several times over and over again in the past three, four days. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in case you don't, uh, my name is Saurat Omadalo. I'm the director of the Center for Ethics of Science and Technology here at Tulane Khan University in Bangkok. Then we have, uh, I think, a big scum, Alizari Bakhari. Fortunately, mm -hmm. he left yesterday to be uh, in Japan. And so he will. Uh, he is the representative for Asian ethnic and religious minorities. I think Abhik has come, Abhik from India. And uh, Abhik Gupta, could you stand and introduce yourself, please? Uh, other mic? Mic. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and your department? Oh, uh, I'm from uh, uh, the Department of Ecology and Environmental Science at <coughs> Assam University, which is in the northeastern part of India. Thank you. Thank you. I my university. I could come uh, from the beginning. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you. And I also would like to take the uh, uh, privilege to introduce the past president, Professor Sam Nyong from the Republic of Korea. He is a very important person and wants to be the most of the world. Thank you very much for coming to Bangkok. Uh, my home country is New Zealand. So I'm um, from the Pacific and the Asian Pacific uh, most of my life. Thank you. Uh, now the agenda, and we will go to the fourth uh, point, Secretary's report and uh, appeal for membership. So, uh, from the beginning of this year, there was a new website uh, for ABA which has um, usually been hosted on the Ubiosephics Institute website. And to make the Ubiosephics Institute and the ABA independent, uh, we moved it from the UNESCO Bangkok website, which has been hosting and decided to, to buy a domain name, uh, ubiosephics.info, uh, because the purpose of the ABA and also devices for free and open discussion of all views and there are sometimes when perhaps institutions uh, uh, have different policies and it's better to have retain this independence. Um, we have a membership that have been refused by saying that they cannot pay. Uh, it's one of the principles of ABA that it's an inclusive uh, society and uh, we give it to people's uh, willingness to uh, contribute. Um, so if you just operate on an annual loss, which is subsidized by sending a uh, job to people. Uh, membership benefits is a hard copy of this journal, uh, which is circulated actually to most members, uh, uh, subsidized by the Device Institute, and it can be downloaded by anyone from the website. Um, so it's an open access journal. And we also encourage uh, people to submit papers to the journal. Um, and also we have published most of the proceedings of this conferences in the past. And again, we uh, plan to publish the proceedings of this conference. Um, and there's a deadline for papers in the end of your abstract book, um, which is uh, in about three weeks' time. Of course, if you can't do it by mail, we still will accept papers later. Um, and I should note also that ADA membership provides discount for conference registration. So that includes, of course, people who haven't even paid for the ADA membership still get a reduced uh, fee. For um, so there is some benefit. We have uh, just heard the uh, introduction to the conference in Indonesia, which 
the ABA board accepted this week uh, this proposal. Um, it should be 2008, <laughs> not 2007. Excuse. This. So we want to make fun of that. This slide is better. It's got the uh, agenda 2008. So we're very. The board is very happy to have accepted the uh, uh, proposal, which was first made uh, in uh, Santa Lupa in Turkey and uh, confirmed uh, by the uh, delegation from Indonesia here. Currently, we've also had a proposal for the 2010 meeting in Singapore, which we've also tentatively agreed to the previous board, um, but we are waiting for more concrete confirmation uh, probably at the time of the Indonesian meeting. We're, we very much hope that members will suggestions that's received by email. And, uh, I think uh, Professor Jenny is also open to receiving proposals today or tomorrow if you were in person to uh, would be useful as well. We also are open to <coughs> go to the discussion. <coughs> and we come to another important uh, open discussion. This is a question that uh, all of us need to consider. But then we can take a stand uh, and make a, or uh, it is possible, what would be, we would we invite your uh, mind, your discussion, and your guidelines and your suggestions on this first question. Should we make a statement on any of issues? As a conference declaration or? Um, we have the vice presidents from particular countries, but uh, we also, have several other countries um, where we have representatives. From Indonesia, we have the National Bioethics Commission, and uh, we just heard the President talking, and uh, Secretary Amru, and we have uh, many delegates. From the Philippines, we have Leonardo De Castro, Shrike, Anoja Fernando, Turkey, Shine, Maxoy, who is another former board yeah. member. So we're welcome to have representatives in other countries. In the past, we had, for example, a person in Europe or a person in a different country who would be open. We also encourage some Australian representatives, for example. The function is to uh, help promote ABA membership and the goals in the area and try to get participants from that country to organize panels or join in this uh, Asian Bioethics Dialogue. Um, uh, for also, we are into regional dialogue is essential as well. So we, uh, it doesn't need to be a country representative only in Asia. We have many people interested in these issues from outside of Asia. And we have never had a policy of discrimination on the basis of it's open to the general body. So in this question that are raised, please voice your opinion with your suggestions. Yes, I'm out of the box. Uh, quite correctly, you have representation for religious minorities. Okay. But I think there was a large religious majority that was left out of the discussion here, which were the Hindus, and I think, uh, sir, you come from India. Now, uh, and I, I think it's a pity that discussions on Hindu biotics, there are some books on it, have not been included. Uh, when I asked Darrell why, why that was so a couple of days ago, he said uh, the, uh, 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 the Confucian uh, representatives had brought the money with them, and that's why they were represented, and that uh, Buddhists were also had brought their money. You mean a panel to be? To no, no, not panel. No. The point is there has been no discussion on Hindu politics. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, is that when I asked uh, Darrell, he said that the, Hindu, uh, the, the Buddhist one and the Thai ones were there because another uh, time the confusion because if I may have misunderstood you that they brought money for participation. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I raised the question to you. So I, I emailed to Hindu friends around the world. There are a lot of Hindu multi billionaires today to say bring the Hindu dimension into it. Because it's an important philosophical 
contribution to humankind, varieties of contribution should be there. Second factor is that we talked about neuroethics uh, yesterday. An important aspect from a biological point of view is evolutionary ethics. It should be brought into this discussion because I believe that some of, at the foundation level, ethics could be derived from some aspects of work done in evolution. So, so being people dabbling in biology, uh, I, I think one should bring those things. I would like to endorse what uh, my friend has said. Uh, I was a little actually uh, uh, disturbed when there is uh, uh, no attempt to represent uh, the Hindu perspective. In fact, I was concentrating on another aspect, maybe the Jainist perspective, where there is a lot of discussion on bioethics, perhaps. Uh, in the coming future, we can think of this uh, Hindu perspective as well as Jaina perspective, so that we can see the different dimensions which can take care of the whole uh, thing. Uh, and another thing is this very important uh, 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 issue, namely whether we have to <coughs> prepare any conference declaration. And I think this is a very important uh, aspect because uh, we can uh, formulate certain resolution uh, toward the end of our uh, discussion, and we can uh, basically for. Uh, uh, I mean, different bodies, so that uh, uh, it could be communicated as our resolution regarding uh, some basic issues. I think among the... Uh, oh, could you come to the mic? In response um, to that also, the reason we had the panels is the panels, you know, provided the FBO for themselves. The next conference too is open to panels, so that's why I've encouraged you, and, and uh, it's good if you can bring panels. But there are many religious uh, religions as well. So we also are happy that in many of the panels we integrate views from different religions into a panel that discusses a topic or theme. So the view on disaster ethics, the view on public health, the view on different topic, and that is a, in a sense a holistic aspect because yeah. if we go through uh, theme by theme, religion by religion, we would have uh, 10 religious sessions on different religions and it might be also interesting and we would usually have the topical uh, selection. So we're open to panel proposals and we take it that you are also supporting this idea that this question that ABA should make a position. Just one question and then a comment. Um, the same issue was raised in the International Association of Bioethics about taking, making some position statements. And we were told that that is not in the Constitution. That's against the Constitution. My question is, I'm not as familiar with the ABA Constitution. Uh, does raising this question mean that this is something that is not in the Constitution? That's my question. And uh, my comment is that I, in my opinion, as members of ABA, I think it is important for us to take, um, to make some position statements. And uh, these obviously would need to be discussed so that the group agrees with it, because I think if for no other reason, and that, that would have some, uh, it's a moral position, and it would have, I presume, some moral force if it's coming from ABA. I think our constitution is open for such a positive commonality of uh, thoughts and foundation. Thank you. I think we might just some suggestion about the conference format. I think we should devote more time for discussions. But that shouldn't be done at the expense of having parallel sessions. I really like, you know, these single sessions so that people don't have to think about where to go. But having retaining that, I think we should devote more time because there are so much of interesting things. We just come and present and go away without having a healthy dialogue discussion debate. So it should be. But again, uh, for certain type of presentations, also 10 minutes may not be the most appropriate thing. So if you can be flexible in, in, in the themes and discussions. Right. This is the Hindu stand on bioethics, like the way you can do perhaps Christian stand or, or you know, uh, Islamic position or Buddhist position. Now, because in, in, in the Hindu sects, you know, the, even the perception of God, you know, it's quite anthropomorphic and down to, you know, nature worship. 
And all of this is loosely fitted into what is called, you know, the Hindu idea of uh, nature and relations and even bioethics. So I think, first of all, uh, there needs to be some serious studies into these aspects. And then I'm sure, uh, obviously, if a number of uh, papers, a number of original thoughts are compiled, I'm sure uh, it could definitely come up in ABA as a panel or an independent position. I think uh, there is an article in the UNESCO 14th session summary by a Hindu uh, leader and a proponent. But you could study that and... A, a, a comment to what was just said. I think, um, and I can only speak from the Islamic point of view, to think that there is one standard thing in Islam that serves as Islamic ethics is probably come down to bioethics. I think the even in Islam, there is a great deal of discussions and differences of opinion. So it's not just in Hinduism. It goes for pretty much, I would think, most religions. Thank you. Rigor of studies and books published by non-Hindus on Hindu bioethics. Uh, for, for example, uh, in the East-West uh, Philosophy Conference, it's published uh, on science. There, there were key articles of a very rigorous nature. And in India, there is a rigorous debate. If you just Google, uh, and there, you'll get uh, the books and some other discussions. So please, don't fuck forward the thing. Uh, one can debate and discuss. And, and especially, uh, I think, uh, I'm going to trade down unnecessary territory, deliberately. Especially when the Pope comes to India and says, makes a declaration of war, that the Hindus shall be converted in this millennium. I think a Hindu position should be brought in. Presented by the proposal, uh, uh, the proposal to have representatives from outside Asia, partly because in a country like Kenya, we have a sizable big population of people of Asian origin. Right? I'm sure they will be happy to uh, know more about this association. And in any case, from the deliberations that we've had so far, I've discovered that we've got a lot in common with people of Asian origin. And this, I, I guess, is going to encourage uh, more dialogue between uh, uh, Africans and, and Asians. Thank you. We should perhaps also be careful that we don't fragment ourselves into what national backgrounds, what religious backgrounds, because that sort of looking back of how problems were solved in the past but our present problems are often quite new and I think the whole of the community needs to work together without having an additional burden of having labels. I feel that the label may actually um, cause separation rather than unity of um, moving forward. That's good. Any other? I wanted to say about some point. One, the first one is we have a medical ethics and the history of medicine centered in Iran and involved in the research and education and <clears throat> some uh, document about the health policy. In the field of education, we involved in the MPH with the aspect of the uh, medical ethics. And two times we have some student uh, <coughs> graduate from the MPH with the aspect of the, the medical ethics. And this time we involve in the MS of the medical ethics, and we try to get license from the PhD of medical ethics in Tehran University. And in the research field, we involve in many projects about the research in field of me medical ethics, and we have a very good database relation to medical ethics, maybe higher than 1,000 who involve in, in the, this database, and very news and med many link to other the. Uh, center of the medical ethics. And this research center involved to design the guideline of the medical ethics, the general guideline, and general guidelines in relation to some speciality about the organ transplantation, genetic, or others. These guidelines get licensed and the signature of the Minister of Health to popularly run. And I wanted to say this center may be put representative of the Iranian population in the ABA 
because the Iran is, is a very big country now, 17 million people live in Iran. And the other point, we involved in the, in the Second International Congress of Medical Ethics in 22 to 24 of November 2007. And I invited all of the uh, member of the ABA maybe possibly involved in, this, in, the, in the medical ethics. And the third point, I think this good idea, we, got, we have a dialogue between the religion and the aspect of medical ethics is very important. But you know, the value of the, the religion overall have some community and some difference. And because of this, I recommend is possible in the Indonesia, with the background of the Islam of the, this uh, country, I recommend if it is possible designing the Islamic panel in the, uh, the seminar relation to the medical ethics. Because I think that we have many, many things common in the medical ethics between the, the scientists and the medical ethics groups. But we have some difference, and maybe we help to each other to popular the guideline be between the Islamic view and the Islamic uh, country. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to reiterate the point that Tula made a little bit earlier about the 10-minute uh, uh, presentations followed by, uh, uh, which become 12 minutes actually, followed by uh, a couple of minutes of questions and answers. Now, uh, this is going to be an issue. We want to accommodate as many uh, talks as possible. Uh, the only way of extending the time is that has to come in, in, in play. I don't, I don't know where the compromise uh, uh, has to take place, but I want some discussion on this. Yeah. On so, the compromise should be in self-discipline. When you say 10 minutes, you should cut down all the other information which is not necessary. I think there must be a conference for training how to present your presentation, and uh, which I do with my students, and uh, not to have too many things in your screen. One like this, which we can be read from the others and build on that part. So that could be one of the uh, solutions that we self-discipline practice. Ten minutes. What are the main points that I want to say to have discussion? Um, that will that that should come from within. Clearly, everybody is miserably failing in that. Yeah, but just just five minutes. So you should have only two or three points to come to be covered in five minutes. The major points, and that would be in number one, two, three, four. And you explain it in five minutes, then you can have a comment. Please. It's just you could have probably more time for the discussions after the the presentation. A big post session is sometimes interesting. Also, so it could be another option. Okay. Yes. Minute. Having one session versus uh, having parallel session is already close. Having one uh, one session for for everybody and stretching this for so, so many number so, so so many number of days is a good thing because I personally would want to choose certain topics that I'm interested in and therefore I should have choices as to which uh, which sessions I should be in and. Uh, I think there are merits and demerits, and, but I think it's on in and at least in my side. I feel that there's more uh, cons to having uh, downside to having single <coughs> sessions, and um, for most of which is the quality of uh, of interaction uh, being limited by brief uh, brief periods, and also on the choices. So, if you can have this voted upon by the general membership, I really appreciate. Uh, I like to say what he wanted to say. Most of us have not, uh, uh, are not uh, uh, English-speaking people. Uh, English is not our first language. We don't think in English. Uh, therefore, it takes time for us to express ourselves. If you're given more time, the discussion is given more time. The questions are longer because it's a good idea. Themes could be divided. Having panel sessions, 20 minutes, and a 10-minute question and answer, 30 minutes per person. Maybe even limiting number of people. Just think, this may be a possibility also. Yeah. You want to make any take positions and uh, should you make a positional statement as a conference declaration? Yes, please. The objectives of the I of the ABA doesn't seem to suggest <coughs> any uh, any. Uh, 
uh, efforts uh, being uh, efforts towards making declarations and uh, I would caution the IDA to making to, uh, to, to any appearances whatsoever making flag waving statements uh, that may not really be in accordance with, uh, with the Constitution um, it is uh, tough enough to come up with uh, a conference so much more come up with uh, declarations in particular uh, uh, sparking and come up with position on, on certain issues. I am not saying it's not possible, but it's probably the last thing that the AB should be doing. Uh, there are a lot more of uh, uh, organizational issues that are of greater importance. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, have, we have become the the host of the next next conference. And I think I think not so far as to make a conference declaration, but at least we prepare a press release and right after the closing, you as a president, uh, Umar as the local press uh, local chairman and several others will stand before the press have them interviewed and you describe what happened during the last five days. That will be a good and manageable compromise that we can do next year. Okay. Thank you. Any other can I board with you discuss that? Yes, sir, sir. Suggestions we have taken and we will come to a decision later. Will the members get to more? Yes. What, what the board says before it's put in? Or how does that work? To come in the journal. Yes. To the journal. So one way is to have the discussion in the journal. Another way is um, to discuss on, to make a list serve and discuss on the on list serve. Uh, if you would like, to make a, a, a list serve on the other groups who are agent by ethics as a list serve which could work, uh, we can do this. Um, and I can make a list serve. Uh, would you like that to exist? Yes. So also the board will meet as well. But I can set up a list serve. I will go and ask. Uh, we'll try and. You'll get an invitation, sir, to a young group solicitor. And unless you accept the invitation, you won't be able to be in a list, sir, because we can't uh, put you on a list, sir, without your consent. And you know, so you have to click something on the e button to come to put it in a list, sir, agree. But we can create a nation by ethics list, sir. And I think that would be a good forum for discussion. And uh, it would be nice if the enthusiasm from this general meeting is reflected in the coming months in this discussion to So we then go to our lunch. So, so lunch is in the back of the room. This room. Uh, last question. We sit in the inside circle, please. Inside or outside circle. And you'll be stuck in here with lots of pain. So we'd like the presentations to speak leave uh, five minutes for discussion now in that time slot. Sample medical ethics, nursing ethics. With so many different groups, it's hard to find a single vision of ethical public health. Values may differ between professional groups. For example, public health physicians and health promotion professionals may have different ethical priorities. It can be difficult to develop a code that everybody agrees to and can feel they can sign up to, particularly if you just adopt one, which was the problem that Valacanya was mentioning this morning, whereby medical ethics has become the de facto code for public health ethics. Third, there's a problem with the overlap between research and practice. And Richard mentioned that this morning in relation to surveillance. 
I'd also like to um, raise the issue of interventions. I mean, there's always a grey area between research and practice. But this is larger in public health, where interventions are not always labelled as research. They may be called demonstration projects, or innovation zones, or reorganisation of services, or something similar. Often a new intervention is introduced, and then there is an evaluation to find out whether the intervention is successful. As Richard mentioned, this is research, but by another name. And if it's not called research, it doesn't receive the same ethical scrutiny as projects that are explicitly labelled as research. Finally, there are generally low levels of funding for public health. Certainly, um, there's been a lot of literature on this, the degradation of public health internationally. And low levels of funding mean that people look for a way to keep the costs down. And one way to do this is to avoid labelling your activity as research, because once you label it as research, you're committed to the research review process, which adds time and often costs to the project. So where can we look to? As we mentioned today earlier, traditional research ethics isn't a great deal of help. The contributions are limited. Research ethics codes traditionally protect individuals rather than populations. The recent formal history of research ethics goes back to the Nuremberg Code and the Declaration of Helsinki, both of which were concerned with protecting individuals and limiting the power of clinicians to do potentially harmful research. The emphasis in these codes is upon informed consent, respecting autonomy, and balancing benefits and burdens for the individuals involved in the research. Once populations are involved, as in public health research, it's difficult to translate the individualistic approach into something that works across the groups. All of these reasons mean that the ethics of public health research are complex and not well fitted to traditional research ethics. What about if we look to codes um, of, of traditional public health ethics, not public health research ethics, but just straight public health ethics. And traditionally, there's been a, a strong utilitarian grounding for public health ethics, the idea that the greatest good for the greatest number should carry the day. Utilitarianism looks at the consequences and the balance of benefits and harms that come from actions, and it's been a major force in public health ethics. For example, um, Richard spoke about the smallpox vaccinations where everybody was vaccinated for the good of eradicating smallpox. Utilitarianism is simple to understand and it seems fair. Benefits and harms to each individual are counted, but the ethical action is the one that produces the most good for the greatest num number. And for problems like the infectious diseases, utilitarianism provided a clear way to justify interventions. The influence of utilitarianism is still very strong in public health ethics and we can see it in tools such as quality adjusted life years where um, interventions are weighed up against each other in terms of the quality adjusted life years, the numbers um, and whether you get more or less for your money. And also evidence based medicine with its cost effectiveness analyses incorporates utilitarian thinking. But as we're well aware there are problems, ethical problems with utilitarianism it can be potentially blind to individual or group inequities. There's the potential for inequities to be ignored or exacerbated in small groups if there are benefits to the whole population. Utilitarianism also focuses on the distribution of material goods, like services, child health clinics, primary health care centres, and so on. But we know that non-material goods matter for health, for good health. Discrimination, poverty, lack of social respect and exclusion all contribute to ill health. But they're not so easily measured when the focus is on the distribution of material goods. <coughs> Finally, traditional utilitarianism has little focus on processes. But the way that things matter, the way that things happen, matters. An intervention may benefit the community, but if it is paternalistic, and overrides legitimate concerns, or if it's carried around, out in a secretive and coercive manner, it may be ethically acceptable, even though the outcome is good. 
So it seems we have a difficult union. There's no easy way to unite the principles of research ethics with public health. And there are problems with adopting traditional approaches in public health ethics into research ethics in public health. So I'll spend the next part of the paper looking at two alternative frameworks for public health ethics to see how these can contribute um, to developing a framework. First I'd like to speak about feminist public health ethics. I'll go through a number of features which I consider to be um, typical of a feminist approach in this area. First of all, feminist public health ethics is concerned with addressing inequities. Not just addressing inequities, but addressing inequities through attention to specific issues. There's overwhelming evidence about the importance of the social determinants nationally. The conditions for health are best met in societies with the least inequity. So feminist public health ethics would be concerned with where the patterns of inequity are and how they can be addressed. As well as economic and financial disadvantage, all of this value can be described as oppression. The second value in procedural justice is that of participation. Participation in determining the actions and the conditions of your actions. And this value recognises the importance of being in charge of yourself, being involved in decisions that affect you and the way that you can live. And the denial of this is domination. And both of these values are very important in developing a way of doing things so that there's procedural justice in the decisions and actions that are taken in public health. Thirdly, distributive justice, which is concerned with to be healthy. This means avoiding exploitation, protecting vulnerable groups, and sharing the benefits fairly. And again, we've heard this morning about some of the challenges in relation to the um, benefit sharing in research. What standards do you use and, and how can this be done fairly? A fourth point um, that is important in feminism is rich empiricism. Not just sticking to one method, but using whatever you can to find the answers that you need to find. Collect data at population levels and to identify potential causes and effects in ways that have led to policies that have been valuable. But this to identify ways to effectively uh, um, intervene for that particular population, for that particular condition. So again, it's that issue of context which has come up um, in earlier papers this morning. This suggests that public health research needs a local focus involving those who are affected and the circumstances of their disadvantage. And this includes any relationships that contribute to oppression and domination as well as the more material aspects. This requires developing skills in listening to and working with local communities as it is by valuing the perspective of the disadvantaged that we can come to understand the problems they face and the kinds of solutions that are, problem, that are possible. Rich empirical methods can take us part of the way, but to go further, to implement locally empowering programs regard, requires political vision. And I think this is one of the central areas that's often neglected in public health ethics, is the absolute necessity to be political. There's a great need for explicit political commitments in public health. Disadvantage and inequity are political problems, but they're major threats to the health of the public. However, it seems difficult for public health to be political. For example, the activities of health departments are limited to health interventions, the so-called silo thinking that um, we hear mention of in, in um, Western policy, but don't, can't, can't offer an income su supplement as a health intervention because that's not considered to be a legitimate health intervention. Another problem is that health research funding is increasingly provided by commercial companies. Um, the Big Pharma is one example, but also the biotech companies that um, develop and fund defibrillating devices and that kind of thing. These companies have no interest in funding low-cost and local solutions for healthcare problems. 
It's very difficult to obtain funding for community-based interventions that aim to assist local communities to achieve their vision of health, especially if there's no profit in the intervention. And this observation, I think, of the situation is exacerbated by the pressure that there is now, certainly in, in my country in Australia and I know in other countries, for research to have a potential um, economic gain. So there's a lot of pressure to find. And finally, um, in relation to political issues, the dominant biomedical model <coughs> and puts virtues first before analyses of acts or of consequences. I'm going to look at just two virtues today. Um, there, are, there are many accounts of virtue ethics and many lists, um, and the, but honesty and courage are usually fundamental to those lists, as is justice, but I've already discussed that in, in relation to feminism. So honesty. Being honest requires us to tell the truth. This has at least two immediate benefits. The first is allowing meaningful communication, because how can you communicate meaningfully if, if you're not being honest? And secondly, building or sustaining trust. Both of these are important for public health. Public health requires communication about risks and how to minimise them. It requires explaining new initiatives, justifying interventions, and so on. Honesty can temper the paternalistic tendencies of public health. A commitment to honesty will require us to explain the reasons for actions so that claims of acting for the public good when it's more convenient to be silent. Um, and again, that comes up in several areas, I think, in public health, where when, when do you announce when there's a, a, a dangerous level of um, an organism in the water, for example, even though the, the organism's normally there, but the level creeps up when you say it's suddenly safe or suddenly dangerous. Public health also requires courage, and this can be both physical and necessary to provide public health services in dangerous situations such as during epidemics. The public health staff involved in identifying the SARS virus were exposed to danger, and, and there were deaths that ensued from that. There's also the courage that may be required to confront powerful interests, which may be professional, political or commercial. It's part of the role of public health to speak out if there are threats, even if this leads to danger for the person involved. And this danger can include personal undermining, intimidation, damage to careers, or physical danger. And I think it's not hard to find examples of all of these. Working in public health requires the courage to be over overtly committed to the aims of public health, which again takes us back to explicitly describing what the aims are. In the next couple of minutes, I just want to give you an example from research um, practice. And this was a project called Starting Well, which was an early childhood visiting program and community development program in a depressed and deprived area of Glasgow, um, known as Gorbals. This was research with the community. Um, there was community consultation about the interventions that the community might like, as well as the implementation of a program of child health visiting. Part of the community development um, arm of the project involved consultations about services that the community would like using public meetings. Attendance at the meetings was fairly low due to the high levels of deprivation, poverty, social exclusion and the shocking weather in Glasgow in winter. But community members who did attend voted for baby massage as a health intervention that they would like for their children. The conditions for funding, however, required that all interventions had to meet certain evidence-based standards and there was no evidence for baby massage that met the particular EBM standard that was required for this project. Therefore, baby massage could not be provided. This project, starting well, was driven by the government's commitment to reducing health inequalities. Yet, despite its good intentions, the project fails against a number of the um, items I've outlined in that potential framework for public health research ethics. First of all, on the surface, this project was designed to decrease inequities, to decrease health inequities amongst the impoverished in Glasgow. But the strategies were limited to the health effects of inequity, rather than trying to address the underlying poverty that caused the health inequities. Was there a focus on procedural justice? No, the project encouraged participation, but ignored the community's wish for baby massage. The rules were set from the outside and were not explained to the community. The process reinforced the powerlessness of the community 
It didn't strengthen and support self-determination. And nobody was able to, to take the step and say, well, in this, in this community, which is rife with domestic violence, alienation, um, all sorts of harsh living conditions, it's something like demand for fair shares. No, the project tried to increase participants' access to services, but these were services that were available by and large to the community, just weren't accessed by this community because of their social exclusion. It didn't try to increase their share of society's resources. And I believe there was a risk that the project might simply enable people to better tolerate their deprivation without changing the material and non-material injustices that led to the deprivation. Did the project use rich empiricism in research? No, it was evaluated and were not responsive to the context. Did it seek political solutions for political problems? No, the project used healthcare solutions for political problems. What was the level of honesty? Um, as I've already mentioned, the terms for the choice of the intervention was not explained in advance, so although there was information about the project, it wasn't the information that people could use when they made their choices about what they were like. And as I've already said, I believe that the project failed in terms of political courage and saying that, okay, this health intervention is a start, but we need more and we need different things as well. So in summary, um, I would like to propose, perhaps as a first stage of an answer to Vala Kanya's uh, challenge this morning for a framework for ethical public health research, um, I think a, a good framework will include at least some of these um, elements, addressing inequities, procedural justice, as well as distributive justice, supporting virtues in the researchers, and above all, political engagement. Thank you. Questions now, please? Yes, please, sir. Predictions in utilitarian you know, principles. Now, uh, I mean, suppose a hypothetical situation where a small group uh, say, refuses to participate in a, say, immunization program which is needed for the whole community and it's for a contagious disease. And if they don't, you know, take it, they remain as a kind of potential island for, you know, again, redispersal of the whole thing. Now, ethically, what should be the, you know, steps to be taken, whether to force them or to really go for, you know, uh, more sustained campaigns? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do not cooperating, and why aren't they cooperating? What are the kinds of reasons behind that? Are there other political issues that might be addressed that might then bring them to the table? Um, do they understand fully what the reasons are for the immunisation? Is there any way that they can have control over um, some parts of the program being implemented? Will they share fairly if they get if they get um, side effects? Are they going to be protected and covered, or are they excluded from healthcare for for other reasons? So there would be I think it would be a way of trying to solve the solution before having to go to a drastic um, solution like force. Yeah. I can't guarantee it though. <laughs> oh, no, so I guess please, please come to the mic. For this, in, for this informative uh, speech, I want to ask about the political, the political solution that you mentioned here, because we have uh, for the public health research a problem in southern Jordan that they are trying to do for the survey for the tuberculosis. And the problem with the people, they refuse to interfere with the researchers and with the investigators as they are coming from uh, some Western countries, they don't believe that they want the, uh, their benefits. How can we deal with this problem as it's a political case? I think that, that highlights public health practitioners, sort of political skills in terms of negotiating, identifying the interests at stake and how you find the right politician or the right um, person in the department to explain the situation as you see it. It's, uh, again, in, um, I did quite a lot of research in this area in Scotland and the political power there of the newspapers was astonishing. So the health, the, 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 just the front page of the rags, the, the health department there was practically run by 
had the local Sunday papers because they didn't want to have any programs or anything that could get onto the front page. So you had situations where programs that were ineffective were continued because they didn't want the front page saying, you know, government slash is program. So I think it's a real, real issue and how we um, equip public health practitioners with the skills to deal with that is, is yet another challenge. I was just wondering, is there any empirical reason suggesting that that kind of uh, practice has any therapeutic value? There have been there have been some randomised control, but the because the so they didn't show definitely that the, the baby massage was better or worse. But they haven't been tried out in this community, which was a community with severe deprivation, high levels of intrafamilial violence, high levels of drug addiction, unemployment. No one had ever done a trial on baby massage with that, with that group. It might have been fantastic or it might have been a disaster, but there was no evidence that the funders could accept, and so it was just excluded. Um, but there has been some research into baby massage. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Discussions? genes and the genetic effects and the epigenetic effects, upbringing, personal circumstances and choices and social conditions under which we live. Lifestyle diseases develop within the socio-biological context. Social contexts are basically family, community, socio-economic hierarchies, incidents in childhood and preconception or prenatal development which I want to concentrate most time on because that is the really cutting edge science at the moment. The past inequities and present marginalisation and neglect. They suffered a lot of losses, loss of land, loss of culture, loss of beliefs and practices, loss of identity, loss of children, the stolen generation. Children of mixed heritage were just taken away and put into um, government uh, or church-run institutions. Can you imagine having a child being stolen from the family situation? And this went on until about 19, uh, into the 1950s. Uh, loss of self-esteem, institutionalization, exclusion, and genocide. Terra nullius means empty land. This is what the English, some of you, some of the nations here. Uh, just in the, uh, in the uh, sort of um, eastern part, more than 200 nations actually evolved on the continent of Australia. In 1944, Aboriginal Australians were allowed to be called Australian citizens. The Aboriginal people called these uh, citizenship papers as dog tags and uh, dog tags. Introduction of infectious diseases had dramatic impact on indigenous health and well-being. Smallpox, measles, whooping cough, scarlet fever, tuberculosis, and influenza. The indigenous population had no resistance to any of these European type diseases. Australia has sectors of its citizens are experiencing this reality that in one of the most economically successful nations on earth, the benefits are not shared fairly among all Australians. From the Australian Bureau of Statistics, we can see the statistics of poverty. 15% of Indigenous households are overcrowded compared to 4% of other households. Infant mortality is three times the national average. 13% of Indigenous births are low birth rate compared with 6% of non-Indigenous births. In early to middle age, 25 to 64 years, lifestyle diseases such as hypertension, cardiovascular, respiratory, renal and metabolic diseases are ten, six to ten times higher than for the population at large. And you can see here uh, indigenous and non-indigenous hospitalization, uh, low birth weight, Australian indigenous babies right along here. Life expectancies for Aboriginals is 15 to 20 years below that of the general population. Uh, most Australians can look forward to uh, living beyond the uh, age of 65. Accidents, suicide, homicide and assault account for one in every sixth registered Indigenous deaths. 
a lot of the deaths are not even registered. Suicide is two to, uh, two to three times more common among Aboriginal and five to six times more prevalent among Indigenous youth compared to non indigenous but account for 20% of the prison population. So, we obviously we inherit more than just our genes from our ancestors. Now, we all know that harmful epigenetic variables may disrupt normal but learnt in recent times about changing gene imprinting processes and their consequent expressions, how the environment actually changes the expression without causing mutations, and also activate fetal programming strategies that change endocrine immune feedback indices that modulate more normal growth, development and postnatal fitness. So most of these lifestyle diseases have their origin in uh, congenitally, pre-birth. All of them, so developmental programming or fetal origin hypothesis, that's all I want to talk about, not about the other ways of epigenetic change. Programming is ascribed to any situation where stimulus or insult during development establishes a permanent physiological response. It's really a truism that life in the womb will be written on, that is operate in utero, may program susceptibility to adulthood diseases by hindering the status of health. Fetal programming occurs when the normal pattern of placental signal signaling is disrupted by the stressful challenges that signal the fetus to adapt to unfavorable interuterine conditions. Glucocorticoids, now as the stress hormones, program the fetal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which in turn influences physiological function throughout the course of life. Epigenetic markers, including DNA and histone methylation, are considered likely mechanisms to induce long term.